For years, the media industry and controversy has gone hand in hand. But when do we need to draw the line? Are we losing our sense of humour by trying to be too politically correct? All this will be discussed with our panel of guests, Fred Mahato, Head of Legal and Regulations Affairs at the ASA, Joe Klolu from Press Office, Oresti Patrikios, CEO of Ornico, Dion Moss, author of Vitboy in Africa, and our guest host is Gareth Cliff from 5FM. I'm Jackie Null and you're watching Media and Money. Zapiro, Dion Mars, um, David Bullard. What do they all have in common? A strong view, pushing boundaries? Well, at what point are you pushing it too far in media? What about freedom of speech? Here to take the discussions further, we have Joe Tlolu from the Press Council, Oresti Patrikios, CEO of Ornico, and two people who are certainly not new to the term controversy. Author of Vitboy in Africa, Dion Mars, and our guest host, Gareth Cliff. Well, welcome, gentlemen. Yeah. Gareth, to start with you, you've got a popular morning show as a DJ. You wake Thank up you. early in the morning. <laughs> I think it's safe to say that you have a love-hate relationship sometimes with your listeners, but somehow they keep on coming back. Do you think it's your controversial issues? Well, if you, if you don't mind, I don't think there's very much hate going on. I think radio is for free, and if people don't like what you're doing on radio, then they tune out. And because they're not subscribing to it, they don't even feel remorse for that. So mm -hmm. it's entirely voluntary and I, I should hope that anyone's listening because they, they're enjoying it and they're deriving some kind of pleasure from it, even if it is at the, the expense of a caller who's cut off some of the time. But I, I think um, I, I have a lot of love for my audience. And in respect to your question about controversy, I think we've reached a stage in 2010 and, and perhaps it's been <coughs> this way for a while now and maybe these gentlemen will agree with me where controversy for the sake of controversy is no longer really something that any broadcaster aspires to. I think it's artificial and it's twee and people can see through it. If you're there for three hours a day, five days a week, you can't pretend for 15 hours. Sure. If you've been doing a show for four years somewhere, there's going to be a crack and someone's going to see it and go, you know what, he's, he's controversial because he wants to be, mm -hmm. not because that's what he really believes. No, uh, well, I, I mean, from my point of view, if you don't, if you can't back up your statement, mm -hmm. then um, you're just you're an attention trouble. seeker. Yes, and right. and you're going to have people who um, who are going to pick up on that, and you're going to be a flash in the pan. Yeah. It's it's not it's not a sustainable way of doing it. So, what drives you in the morning to get up at four o'clock in the morning, be in business <laughs> personality? Uh, so waking up is the only part of my job that I don't enjoy. The, the minute you get in there and you start taking calls from people and you start looking at what's going on in the newspapers mm -hmm. and, and what's happening in this amazing country of ours where there's a different story every day to keep people amused, mm -hmm. it, it, it would be very difficult for me to, to think of any other kind of occupation sustaining me and keeping me interested for as long mm -hmm. as this one has. Mm -hmm. I, I absolutely love every minute of it and mm -hmm. it doesn't require hard work. It requires a, a little bit of thought and occasionally your audience is smarter than you are and, and you've got to accept that that happens. Yeah. Um, but I, I love it. I, pff, there's, there's no reason in the world that I could say a bad thing about radio. Perhaps radio management aren't always the smartest <laughs> people. Okay. But, but that's, not my, that's not my problem. I just do the show as long as people are interested in listening. You're just there to, to, yeah. to earn a salary. Dion Moss. <laughs> <laughs> Dion Moss, um, do you think that we are too sensitive, given our history in South Africa, are we too sensitive as South Africans, are we trying to be too politically correct? Uh, yes, we are too sensitive, we are trying to be too politically correct. The, uh, the problem for me stems from the fact that up until 94, there was no culture of debate in this country. It was the duomini and the policeman and the teacher mm. that told you how to think. Or the trade union leader. Or the trade union leader. Since <laughs> 94, we've been in a position where we have open debate, uh, or we can have open debate, but South Africans have still not mastered the art of debate at all. Um, I think that to a large extent South Africans still, somebody says something that you don't like, you go, ah, you know, instead of actually listening to what they have to say um, and uh, trying to understand their point of view, you don't have to agree with it, mm -hmm. but you have to try and understand other people's point of view. And then this other thing, this, uh, this politically correct thing, you know, we're <coughs> obsessed with two things in this country, the one's skin color and the other one's the weather. Now, I'm not going to be talking about the weather today, but we're so aware of what color everybody is or what their uh, nationality is or things like that, that, that we're looking at things through very skewed, skewed eyes. And instead of uh, understanding that, that Julius Malema is an
you know, it's got nothing to do with the fact that he's black, you know, um, or, or anything like that. And, and for me, as somebody who's also an African, um, but is of, of lighter pig pigmentation, it, uh, I should have the right to be able to criticize anybody or anything without being branded a racist. Mm. Aresti, I'd like to bring you in at this point. If you look at a Dion Maas or a David Bullard and you look at the, the controversial articles that were written, don't you think the owner should be on the editor to, to, to publish or not publish? Um, no, I don't. I mean, I think, I, 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 I think editors should publish. I think uh, what I think is we've become a nanny society in actual fact. I think we're just too um, obsessed by uh, banning this and banning that. And coming, coming from an advertising uh, background, mm -hmm. I mean, the fact that you're banning cigarettes, I'm an anti-smoker. I'm a big anti-smoker, but banning advertising on, on television is ri ridiculous. Why? To protect who? You're actually protecting the no fact is, The fact is, having done that, if you don't mind me interjecting, uh, banning a, a billboard on the highway uh, to me seems counterproductive because now you've forced these companies to market in far more fiendish ways. They're, they're, they're now insidiously going into places of entertainment and actively giving the first packet of cigarettes away for free and then saying if you want more you'll have to pay from them from, from, from now on. If you were an impressionable non-smoker you would, you would be far more likely to, to become a smoker as a result of the latter than a billboard on mm. the highway with some camel guy reclining in a, in a, a, a riverbed. I really think that, that <laughs> the idea of banning things, I completely agree with you, is, is a, a very complicated and difficult territory to enter into. But I think Joe has the toughest job of all. Yeah. Because, because he has to weigh these things up on a daily basis. Absolutely. So let's hear from you, Joe. What is, what is your um, role at the press council? Um, essentially to ensure that um, publications adhere to the press code. Right. And the press code is very simple. Mm -hmm. We believe absolutely in freedom of speech. The only limitations are the limitations set by the Constitution. No hate speech, no incitement to violence, etc., etc. But ultimately we believe in free speech. Mm. But society has put itself in a, a box. Um, they've given us permission to speak. But at the same time, they still want to have a say in what right. we say. Right. So it is a quandary that society finds itself in. But the, the, the uh, media themselves have decided uh, to limit what they do and what they don't do. That's why we've got the press code. Mm -hmm. That's why we've got the BCCSA mm -hmm. code. Right, right. So ultimately, mm -hmm. we limit ourselves because we believe we are there to serve society. Yeah. Do you think that's a good thing, by the way? Because I, I, I think most of us would rightly believe that the Constitution gives enough protection for, for those who might be hurt by an absolute freedom of speech in, in preventing hate speeches, in particular in the incitement to violence. But I think that should be enough. Are you, are you saying that too? Because you're saying the media puts these rules no, on no, themselves. As I say, ult ultimately, if you look at the, South, the press code, it's based on Section 16 of right. the Constitution, which says we've got freedom of speech. But what I'm asking so is, ultimately, is, is, are you saying so that's enough? That, that, no, no, what I'm saying is the code merely um, uh, expands on what is in the Constitution without limiting us further. Um, if you take a simple example, take hate speech. Mm. Uh, the Constitution talks about hate speech and it ends there. Mm -hmm. But we have gone further and we have we've said if you say something disparaging about a particular group, about a particular segment of our society, then that we will not be acceptable in our, co in our code. So we have in a way expanded what is in the, in the, in the Constitution. You, you believe because it's, it's we enough believe but it requires because, investigation? Because we believe it is important to protect innocent readers. Mm. At what point will you state a case? Is it after one complaint? Or how does the process work in terms of complaints? You know, um, what happens is that any person can complain if that person has an interest mm -hmm. in that particular story. So you have to then open a case after and one complaint? And then I look at that complaint. This is always something that's confused me in broadcasting too, and I understand that that's your responsibility. It's, it's perfectly sensible from your point of view. In broadcasting, it, it requires one angry, uptight old granny in Kilani to effectively bring a tribunal together yeah. Yeah. on a matter which nobody else has any problem with. And in advertising, this must frustrate you 
endlessly because one prude equals a case. And, and that prude may represent a tiny, tiny scion of, of the population. No, no, it, 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 it's not just one person who is able to bring broadcasting to a halt. What happens no, is that you, 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 you evaluate what that complaint is. There are so many complaints that we just dismiss with one line. And we say, unfortunately, there's nothing in this. But then once you believe that there is some element uh, that needs to be investigated, it's only then that you go and investigate. Mm. Well, <clears throat> I mean, firstly, I don't believe in any form of regulation. At all? Uh, uh, because I think it's... <laughs> You're an anarchist. <laughs> well, well, I mean, we, we, ha we have a constitution, mm. right? And everything should be measured according to that. Um, <clears throat> and I find that more and more newspaper editors are applying self-censorship uh, because of uh, uh, commercial constraints mm. rather than, than anything else. And, and this is something that really worries me because, I mean, if, if you start breaking this thing down as to, as to where it's coming from and where it should be going, theoretically speaking, the media should not have uh, shares for sale because shareholders put pressure on ha people having to make more money every year. So what you have in newsrooms acro across the country is a, a lot of journalists with a lot of experience being axed because they're too expensive. So it's this death of knowledge. But or worse, or worse, when the media owner tries to tailor make the news in such a way as to appeal to the audience yes. without having any regard for fact or for balance. Uh, in other uh, words, if uh, you have uh, an audience, uh, perhaps, <laughs> of, no, if you, if you have an audience that, that, that wants to hear a certain angle on a story, then yes. that is the angle you publish like regardless of the journey. If you're dead and white, you end up on the cover of Bill. No, 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 Joe, no, no, Joe, let's, 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 let's look at what you're going to say. Um, what, what happens is that an ordinary person in the street cannot afford to go to court to go and uh, assert his uh, rights as an individual. And if you are going to say, let the Constitution be the arbiter, you are in fact excluding such a huge number of people who will not be able to afford to go to court. In the same way, the publications themselves cannot afford the type of uh, suits that, uh, that, that, that take them to court. So in the end, we provide them a very cheap very cost-effective way of resolving the differences. So, so what percentage? But ultimately, ultimately, it is in fact in the interest of both the public as well as in the interest of the publications themselves that we have a self-regulatory system. But why? No, Wh why do you have to regulate yourself? Because I mean, better that than being regulated. Being regulated by you no, If no, you're in the media, have, you're, they should not <laughs> be. No, but, no, but, <laughs> you're, you're, you're being utopian. I mean, it's impossible that the media would, would be a not anarchist. Yeah, but well, they're the same thing. Yeah. I think it's a, it's a heated discussion, <laughs> but we have to go to a break, so let's leave it there for now.